Well, happy Sunday, everyone. Welcome once again to Yakima Foursquare Church. Uh, again, my name is Chantal, and I get the privilege of being a lead pastor here. And man, it is such a good day to be in the house of the Lord. It is a hot day. I will say that. I was thinking about it in between services. I was like, man, this reminds me of when I was in Israel. And we're just like bringing the Holy Land experience to you, okay? Because it is warm in Yakima this week. This morning, we get to continue our Faith Does series, our study through the book of James. And today, specifically, we get to go through chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. And this really has been such a life-giving series so far. And my prayer for us today is as we walk out of this place, that we would feel encouraged, challenged, and that we really would be transformed by the Holy Spirit. We're going to have a moment to just kind of sit and contemplate here at the end um, and just allow the Spirit to do a work in us. So jumping right in this morning, what I want to do is read the whole passage of scripture that we're going to be processing today because I want us to have the main idea of the context of what we're going to be talking about and then I'm going to break it down a little bit as we go. So this section of scripture is titled warning against worldliness. Okay so that's what that sub subtext is called. So James chapter 4 starting in verse 1 It says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God? Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? It's a little bit heavy, right? (laughs) Are you feeling encouraged this morning? Are you ready? This is going to be good. Today, I want to take the next 25 minutes to really just process out loud with you what God has been speaking and doing in my heart this week. I want to break down what James is saying here. And and what I want to do is talk about how and why this applies to us today. Because if there's anything that has continued to be a, a constant theme throughout this series is that we realize once again and again and again is that it's not by our works that we're saved, right? It's not our actions. It's not our works. It's it's our it's by grace through faith that we are saved. The Bible says not by works so that no man can boast, right? But we know that our works, our actions are simply an overflow of the heart transformation that we've experienced. And this series continues to be a really critical series for the state of our church as we continue in our year of framework. We believe that God spoke the word framework to us for the year 2021 because we just have declared and believe that God is rebuilding us from the inside out. All of the stuff that we've been going through in the last year and a half really just exposed so much of the brokenness inside of us as individuals, inside of our churches, inside of us as just people individually and collectively and I said this a lot over and over last year but when put under pressure when squeezed the true nature and character of a person begins to be exposed and I'm not just talking about YFC I'm not just talking about here but I'm talking about collectively as a whole And to be honest, I don't think that God allowed all of the trials of the last year to happen for us to get to this point and for us to be like, sweet, let's just go back to normal. Let's just go back to how it was. Because I believe that he's rebuilding us from the inside out. And what we're seeing is that he's refining us through the fire. How many of you know that's how diamonds come, right? He refines us through the fire. And that sometimes means it's a little painful. 
But scripture says that it's God's loving kindness that leads us to repentance. So if it's God's loving kindness that leads his people to repentance, I believe it's the loving kindness of the local church that will help usher in revival, amen? We need revival. That's what we've been praying for. That's what we've been talking about and believing for these days. Revival is what this world needs. In this passage of scripture today, we see James addressing three different wars going on in our lives. And these wars uh, that we're going to look at this morning imply destruction, chaos, and a lack of unity. Now, if you're taking notes this morning on those little bulletins that you get when you walk in, the first type of war that we see James addressing uh, right away in verse 1 is a war with each other. So point number one is a war with each other. Again, verse 1 states, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Now, if you were to look at and examine some of the early churches throughout Scripture, you would realize that they were actually pretty dysfunctional. Uh, there was a lot of stuff that they were working through as well. We see in 1 Corinthians 6 that the church in Corinth was comp competing with one another in public spaces to the point that they even began to sue each other in court. So Paul had to deal with that. In Galatians 5, we see that the Galatian believers were warned against destroying one another. In Ephesians 4, Paul had to admonish the Ephesians to cultivate spiritual unity because that's how divided they had become. So we know because of the brokenness of this world and the brokenness within us that oftentimes we are at war. We are in conflict with others. So again, he says, what causes quarrels and fights among you? Picking up in the second half of verse one, is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. The second type of war that we see being depicted here by James is a war with ourselves. A war with ourselves. What we see James doing in this passage of scripture is implying that as human beings, we are rarely ever satisfied. He asks almost what seems like a rhetorical question here. He says, why are you fighting? Is it not because you are empty inside? Is it not because your passions from your flesh are, are pulling for your attention? Is it not because you're focusing on the wrong thing because, because you're empty inside? You know, Jake shared with you guys last week our personal mantra, something that we've learned over the last several years of our marriage that is just like common language in our home. And we talked about how the root of most of our issues, whether it be in our marriage and life and any relationships, we can always narrow it down to unmet expectations. That's just what it comes down to. Every time we're in an argument or one of us is frustrated, it's because one of us had an expectation that the other one did not meet, right? Unmet expectations. So in this passage of scripture, we see unmet expectations on display. We see that the reason for the chaos in our lives is oftentimes that we are asking God to fill us, but we are asking him to fill us with the wrong things. We see in verse three, James says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You know, praying is one of those things that it's an interesting topic because it can simultaneously both be one of the most simple, uh, like simple, easy concepts to understand and also like the most out there, complicated, challenging part of the Christian walk with Jesus. Because if you're wired like me, I, I have an achiever type of personality. I like checklists. I like to be um, like really productive. I, I'm kind of a perfectionist. I like to do things right the first time. So when it comes to prayer, that can be hard for me because I, I just, I want to do it right the first time. I want to get it right. I want to know, I want to have a recipe for how to communicate with God perfectly each and every time, regardless of context. And as I say that out loud, I know that that sounds dumb because that's not how it works, but like, that's really like, that's what I want. That's what I wish I had. And so I've listened to a lot of sermons and, and, and listened to, um, podcasts and read books about prayer because I want to understand. I want to know God's heart for us. And I've even heard it said by some that there's no wrong way to pray. Have you ever heard that before? There's no wrong way to pray because ultimately we're just talking with God. And there are elements of that that I absolutely agree with. I believe when it comes to posture and preference, like, man, I, I pray to God in the car. I pray when I'm laying in bed. I fall asleep during prayer. I pray with my eyes open. I pray very casually. Like, I, that's not what I'm talking about. 
What I'm talking about here is that this verse is addressing, it's not the posture or style of the way that we pray that James is talking about. He's talking about how the content of our hearts as we begin to pray is revealed. And that is where we find the issue at times. We can actually pray incorrectly when all we're praying for, all we're pursuing is worldly wants, urges, and desires. Because as we begin to say that out loud, as we begin to communicate that, the contents of our heart is revealed. We get the heart of prayer wrong when we only go to God asking him to fill us with the things of this world. You know, we have to get to a point where we truly understand that the purpose of prayer is not to get our will done in heaven, but to get God's will done here on earth. And the thing with this type of selfishness, the selfish living, selfish praying, it always leads to chaos. It always leads to conflict, to war. And if there's chaos and conflict on the inside, there's going to be chaos and conflict on the outside. And the kicker is, is that people who are oftentimes in conflict, in war, whether it be with themselves, with each other, or with God, are oftentimes the most unhappy people. Because instead of being grateful for what we do have, we find ourselves being ungrateful for what we, we're not grateful, we, we're, we're focusing on what we don't have. You see, James is saying in this chapter that our heart's desire should be that God is enough, that he is enough for us. But instead, if I'm not careful, what I see happening in my own prayer life is I find myself asking God to give me things that will fill me, things that will bring me fulfillment, and unintentionally, I ask him for things outside of himself. Now, it's not wrong to make your needs and your requests known to God. Okay, hear my heart as I say this. In fact, God invites us to come before him, to share our hearts, to, to bring all of us, right? To bring the messy, the clean, the, the pretty, the ugly, the nasty, the broken, all of it. God wants all of it. So bring everything of who you are to him. And that includes your hearts, your, your wants, your desires, right? We know that God is Jehovah Jireh. That means God, our provider. That's his character. That's who he is. We can trust that. We know that's who he is. But what I'm referring to is when we get to the point that the only thing that we ask him for, the only time we communicate to him is when we're bringing our selfish desires to him. When we ask him, instead of filling us with his love, his joy, his peace, we're asking him for the things of this world in hopes that they bring us his love, his joy, and his peace. Do you see the difference? There's a difference. Galatians 5.13 says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Verse 16, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. So outside of the spirit, we will naturally want to gratify the desires of the flesh. We naturally are selfish human beings outside of walking in the spirit. And that's why in verse four, James calls us adulterous people. And adultery is a strong word, right? We've talked about the gut punch that is the book of James. Every chapter, you just kind of feel like, oh, that hurts. I don't like it. But the picture that James is painting is that we have an opportunity, the incredible opportunity to be in a life-giving, fulfilling relationship with the creator of the world, with the, with the giver of life, with the one who loves us, who died for us. And instead of leaning into that, we lean into asking the ultimate source of life to give us substitutions of what we think will bring us happiness. So what we're doing is we're actually asking God to give us something that would, in fact, replace him. And that's why James uses the word adultery. Moving on to verses 4 and 5, James says, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? You see, the third type of war that James is depicting in this chapter is a war with God. Number three is a war with God. How does a believer declare war against God? You become friendly with God's enemies. You get entangled with the things that are not of him. And it's really tricky because becoming worldly happens super gradually. Most of the time we don't even realize when we're being influenced. We don't even realize when we're beginning to adapt to culture and think that things are normal. We don't even realize it. 
Jake read to us last week, Romans 12, 2. It says, do not conform anymore to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, if we're not able to do what Romans 12, 2 says, then the end result is that we will be condemned with the world. That's what that means. You see, the creator yearns jealously for us. So as we go to him in prayer, what we see happening is that as we pray, we are at war with our passions. What we're saying as we pray for our selfish desires is, God, you're not enough. You are not enough for me. I need you to give me these things because you're not enough. And the thing with these types of prayers is we have to understand that what the scripture says is once we go there, once we start going down that spiral, that we become enemies of God. And Francis Chan, a really well-known pastor and author, he explains it this way. He says, when you find yourself in this position, it's not that you're looking up at God saying, okay, we're, you're my enemy now. No, it's God looking at us saying, you're my enemy now with a broken heart, devastated. This alone should cause us to reevaluate the posture of our hearts. So this morning, my ask of you as we go throughout this week, would you pause would you reflect? Would you ask yourself, where are you searching for fulfillment? Are you searching for fulfillment in the things of this world? Or are you searching for fulfillment in Christ? Ponder that. Be honest with yourself. Verse 6 then continues by saying, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You know, part of my reality as being a public speaker, what I do for a living is I'm a pastor. I get to preach the word of God, best job in the world. But part of my reality is sometimes people don't like what I have to say. Okay? Sometimes people don't like hearing hard truths. They don't like it because it makes them uncomfortable. But what the Bible is saying is if the words that I'm speaking to you right now, if they make you feel uncomfortable, if you're challenged, if you're frustrated, if you're feeling called out, the Bible, not me, okay, not me, love me. The Bible says, stop being defensive. Stop being defensive. Don't be arrogant. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace, but gives grace to the humble. And I know that that can feel really hard to do sometimes. But the beauty of what James does is immediately he follows up a statement like that and gives us ways, action steps on how to do that. Verses 7 through 8 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Notice that submit and draw near. These are acts of submission. These are action steps. Okay, These are things that we actually have to do in our life. You see, you see, submission is an act of the will. It's saying, not my will be done, but yours. That's why oftentimes you'll hear me pray from the front. I pray it all the time in my daily life. God, more of you and less of me. More of you and less of me. Because very quickly does my will try to rear its head and run the show. And you might be asking, how do we do that? James says in, in the second half of verse 8 through 10, he says, Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. In other words, in the places in your life that you used to brag about, in the places in your life where sin used to be like, used to freely flaunt that, you used to post pictures of that, laugh at those jokes, do those things, it says, James says, let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves so that the Lord may exalt you. Remember, this, is, this isn't about condemnation or judgment. It's about God's loving kindness leading us to repentance. And James is saying here that it's okay to recognize when we've been wrong. It's okay to experience conviction and repentance because we know that it leads to the freedom of forgiveness. We know that. And the beauty of this is that as we obey these instructions, that God will draw near to us. He will cleanse us, forgive us, and the wars, the chaos, the conflict that we talk about will cease. We will not be at war with God. We will not be at war with ourselves or with each other. And I know that when we read portions of scripture like this, it kind of feels like harsh. Am I right? Like I read the scripture this week and I was like, Jake, why me always? Like I always feel like I have to talk about the hard stuff. I'm like that, like cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Like I don't want to say that to you, but here's the reality. This is the whole gospel. 
And the gospel is good news, am I right? We don't need to shy away from the good news of Jesus. So what that means is that we get to hold in tension the fact that Jesus loves us and died for us and is for us and forgives us, but also we are called to a higher standard. So we preach grace, we preach love, and we preach truth. It's a combination of all, all three. It's not one or the other. It's not an unbalanced scale. It's even love, grace, and truth. And so although stuff like this might feel heavy and hard, and it's not always my favorite thing to communicate, it's part of the realities of walking with Jesus. He calls us to a higher standard. How else are we supposed to stand out? How else are we supposed to create change in Yakima? Our community needs Jesus. The amount of shootings that have happened, the amount of stuff that's happening around our world, we need to stand out. We need to be different. And so part of that looks like us being called out and called up to be different. James closes up this portion of scripture in verses 11, 12. He says, do not speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you will not be a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? So ultimately, as we wrap up this portion of James chapter 4, what we see James saying here is that we are called to cease fighting, to stop quarreling with those around us, to find our fulfillment in Christ and Christ alone, not in worldly substitutes, and to strive for holiness. But as we do that, as we begin to strive for holiness, James warns us against falling into the trap of becoming judgmental Christians. Because Here's another part of our reality. Christians have a reputation. It's not always a great one. It's one of the unfortunate realities. Now, here's what I believe. I, when people talk about, like, church is filled with hypocrites, I'm like, absolutely, I am. We are saved by grace, not by works, so that no man can boast. However, that reputation that we have of being judgmental what does that do? What does that win us? What favor do we win with man by being judgmental like the rest of the world? James says, who do you think you are? There's literally only one judge. And spoiler alert, it's not you and it's not me, right? We will all be judged by him in the end. Galatians 6 says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the spirit should restore that person gently. Gently. It doesn't say if you catch someone in sin, shame them to the point that they change from their behavior. That's not what the word of God says. It says restore them gently. Remember, it's God's loving kindness that leads us to repentance, not our human judgment that shames people into changing their behavior. And if it's God's people, if we are God's people, I firmly believe that it will be the church's loving kindness that helps usher in revival. As we begin to close this morning, I want to take a few moments to just reflect. I mentioned that I wanted to do that. Sweet, I'm, I got time. We're doing good. Uh, what I want us to do is just begin to evaluate the state of our hearts. I want us to currently just, just sit and ask ourselves, are we at war? Are we in conflict with ourselves, with people, with God? Are we trapped in worldliness? And have we forgotten that God has called us to a different standard? Have you maybe been praying and, and unintentionally asking God to fill you with things that would simply replace him? And so our heart is actually in the wrong spot. Are you maybe feeling some conviction about the way that you're realizing, man, I kind of tend to judge people and remembering that we're not the judge, only he is. My prayer for us this morning is that we would ask God to search our hearts, to know us, to reveal to us where it is that he needs to do a work this morning. So as Mari plays the keys for a few moments, I just wanna invite us to sit and listen. I'm gonna pray for us and we're just gonna sit in silence and see what God would say to you because the Holy Spirit is here and the creator of the universe, he loves you and he wants a relationship with you, and he speaks to you. You have the ability to hear his voice, that still small voice. So let's sit in silence. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to speak to us in these next few moments 
I know a lot of times we're rushing and it's the hustle and bustle of the daily life and, and even our quiet times can be overrun with kids screaming and yelling and all kinds of stuff. And God, right now we just give you these next 30 seconds. And Lord, we say, would you speak to us? Would you reveal to us where it is that you wanna do a work in us? Thank you, God. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the cross. We repent for the ways in which we have been at war with ourselves, with others, and with you. We repent for the ways in which we have tried to make it about other things other than you. We repent for being judgmental and harsh. Holy Spirit, would you do a work in our hearts today? God, would you make us more like you? Make us more like you. As we continue in this posture of prayer, if in this, in this process you've been recognizing, maybe for the first time, maybe, maybe just a reminder of what you've been sensing God say to you for, for some time, is that you need a change in your life. Maybe you've been at war your whole life. It's just chaos after chaos after chaos, conflict after conflict. And you need direction. You need peace. You need joy. You need love. You need a savior because you can't do it on your own. There's a God who loves you, who can restore and fulfill you. And his name is Jesus. We are a church who believes in the death and resurrection of Jesus, who believes that no one is too far gone to experience his love and his grace. We believe that God is not mad at you. He is madly in love with you. So if you're here this morning, and, and maybe you've never made this decision, maybe you have, and it was a long time ago, and a lot of things have happened since, and you just need to rededicate your life. You need to choose Jesus for yourself, because recognize it doesn't matter if you grew up in church. That doesn't make you a follower. It doesn't matter if, if your parents are believers and followers. It's a personal choice. You have to make this choice for yourself. Remember, this is the, the Bible talks about that. All it takes for us to be saved is to acknowledge, right? Believe that Christ is Lord. Confess with our mouth that we are sinners and that we are saved. But there's also a third element, and that is the submission of our will. We submit our will. And so if that's you, if you're in this place and, and you need to make that decision to say yes to Jesus, to give your life over to Jesus, to make him the Lord and savior of your life, would you just raise your hand to indicate that's you? Anyone in this place or online, this is an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. I see that hand. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? Thank you, Lord. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna pray this prayer out loud and I'm gonna invite you guys to pray this out loud with me. This is the prayer that ushers us into a relationship with God. And even if you're already a Christian, here's my challenge to you. It's one thing to believe that God is real. It's another thing to confess with our mouth that we need him, but we have to actively surrender our will to him. So would you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, Thank you for your love. Thank you for the cross. This morning I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you are my savior. Please forgive me of my sins. I surrender my life to the God of the Bible. Help me to walk with you every day. Help me to be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. He is good.